Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. Second time trying to upload. A lot of little attacks going on. Going to ask for some prayer because of these attacks. The slides, things were freezing up. The camera wasn't working. A lot of distractions today. My wife is busy working. My dog's over there. The fans and AC are blowing. So uh, hopefully everything's up and running. But I am asking for some extra prayer. Extra prayer for my wife and I. Um, it seems it, really comical to me on one hand because when I go to announce something where I want to go forward in the plan of God and do more, like a conference and get people motivated, um, and even when I teach on a message like I'm getting ready to teach, liberalism is a stepping stone toward paganism. <laughs> when those kind of things happen, it seems like the kingdom of darkness comes into your personal life, your business life, and they start little attacks little stumbling blocks, little distractions, and I can tell you right now, the wife and I have been feeling them. So we need prayer, okay? Um, nothing major, but I, I get a sense the attacks are coming, uh, different things are going on in the personal and the business end of uh, PRB ministry that are attacks. I can feel them, and I know what it's about. It's about me really um, finally getting comfortable down here, even though I'm in a temporary studio for the next four months until the house is built. But I'm starting to put together ideas about maybe a conference or going forward, trying to put together a little booklet and focusing on different things like that and then teaching a message like this and boom, the attacks happen. So I don't want to get into them. I just need your extra prayers. I also want the prayers for my close friend James, um, his family down here, close friends of my wife and I. It is his father up in New England that's dealing with cancer. I still need those prayers. This is a gentleman up there in New England, an older gentleman who's dealing with his second or third bout with cancer that looks like it's stage four. So we need prayer for the family. We need prayer for that gentleman up in New England. I believe my friend James is going to fly up to see his father and spend some of the days with him. Um, could be his last days. So we don't know. I hope he's born again and saved. We never know. People talk about going to church or being part of a certain denomination, but you don't know truly if they're born again and saved. And I'm not sure the issue with the... Uh, father up in New England. So pray for that. We're going to pray for the family, pray for the attacks on my wife and I, the different things going on. I appreciate it. So every head is bowed, every eye is closed. We're getting ready to jump into it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth and like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all may grow in respect to our salvation. We need to be filled with God, the Holy Spirit's power, which cleanses us when we cleanse ourselves from sin. That power has a cleansing ability when we acknowledge, name, and sight sin believers, and we get filled with the Spirit, be able to reflect that new nature of Jesus Christ and have our fellowship in order so that way we're actually absorbing more of the Word of God because it is difficult to absorb the Word of God in your flesh, and you want to walk in that new nature. So we cover 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10, the beginning of every message, to remind us, believers, we need to wash ourselves from sin and get in the new nature. 1 John 1, 8, if we, are if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if, believers, we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, sins you might not have known about. Verse 10 said, believers... 1 John 1.10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, his word is not in us. Let's not do that. Let's take a moment of silent prayer now. Wash the sin from the life, our lives. Get the distractions removed and pray for those things I'm asking you about, along with the other things, obviously. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're just asking right now for that wall of fire around my wife and I. Protect us from the different little flaming arrows, the little tricks and schemes, the stumbling blocks for the ministry or for our personal life or for whatever's going on. We're asking for that wall of fire, that protection. And I'm asking also for you to touch the family of our friends down here and the gentleman up in New England who's dealing with the cancer issue we've been talking about and praying about. Father, you know what to do in these situations. We simply need to pray for the family, for them to come together. We need to pray in unity, Father, as has power in unity. And we just need to pray that this gentleman is born again and saved. And if it is his time, Father, that he goes out gracefully and with less pain. That's what we're asking for. 
He goes out in a gentle way, a gentle spirit, Father. We're just asking these things. And if you are ready to prolong his life, Father, it is up to you. We want that to matter in your plan, Father. We want to be praying for your will, not our will. We're asking for these things. We're also asking for your healing hand with vaccines and viruses, political unrest, lies of our media, our politicians across the world, division, whether it's racial division, political division, uh, our social division, whatever it is, Father, your healing hand across the world with all these issues. I'm asking you to bless those believers that lift this ministry up and that have been faithful to this ministry, Father. Please continue to put a wall of fire, protect them, and promote them in your plan, Father. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us jump into it. I appreciate the prayers. I appreciate all the support. Um, I read from Julie's email last message, which was really uplifting. I looked at it again this morning. I needed a little lifting up this morning had some things going on so um i appreciate the prayer thank you julie thank you everybody for the support i saw some people put different uh notes on the youtube page and the different pages i i put my messages on and they were really uplifting telling me don't worry about the air conditioning the fan just teach the word which is good because i'm trying to do the best i can in a, in a temporary environment a very small environment a tight environment and there are a lot of distractions just so you know uh, personally and even for the ministry itself so please keep it in prayer we are in lesson Matthew 313 of the Matthew series 313 today is May 6 year of our Lord 2021 5 6 21 the title yes the title I think sparks some interest in the kingdom of darkness liberalism is a stepping stone toward paganism liberalism is a stepping stone toward paganism let me grab a drink go to Matthew chapter 20 I know when I teach certain subject matters or I feel the momentum going in a positive direction or I announce that I want to do more or God reveals something no more I can do, whether it's a conference or a book or whatever it is, I know I can feel the heat being turned up by the little angry fallen angels around every corner that are trying to trip us up here when we want to go forward in God's plan. You can feel the heat, so we got to deal with it. <laughs> I can feel the heat physically here in Florida, but I can feel the heat from the kingdom of darkness. Matthew 20, verse 6 is where we left it off. We're going to jump into Matthew 26. And my wife is working today, so I'm by myself. The dog's over there, the fan and the AC are on, so hang with me here. Uh, I had some problems with my slides earlier. I had to retake the whole thing again. Uh, computer froze. Just it's been a lot going on. Thank you for the prayers. I appreciate it. Keep it up, please. Matthew 26. And about the 11th hour, the Lord is talking about his parable, the landowner. He, the landowner, the wealthy landowner, which represents God, went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? We covered that principle pretty well last lesson. Matthew 27. They said to him, because no one hired us, so he said to them, you go into the vineyard. God calls all of us, no matter what we think, whether others overlook us, God wants to use us. It is up to us to be eager and available to be used having the positive attitude as we covered last lesson these workers either were lazy and late to the job one or the other or they had some type of weakness or unattractiveness as far as being an employee you know how you look at somebody and say i don't know if i want to hire them so there's something going on either there was a lazy issue with them or maybe they were weaker and unattractive employees that other landowners and businessmen were not interested in using them. But we know God is. We looked at the warning for the idol believers last lesson. We also touched on the fact that God continually goes out and calls people into his field, believers that are sitting idle, and keeps calling them, saying, come on, I want to use you too as well. So we looked at the warning for the idol believers. We also touched on the fact that God continually calls us and seeks us out continually calls and seeks us out no matter who we are or how weak we seem to others he wants to use us and it's not too late to be used that's the other aspect of this it's never too late we're gonna to have to look at that principle as well probably next lesson Matthew 20 verse 8 is where we are today there it goes again it's frozen so we're gonna try this one more time hang with me and I'm gonna do something real quick I'm not gonna stop we're gonna keep going we're going to stop and go like this, and go like that, and go like this. One more time. 
And where are we? There we are. This is what I'm telling you. This has been going on, just so you know. That's part of the attack on the ministry. Little things, but attack personal attacks as well. Just so you know, I might have to do it a couple of times. That's where Satan is at, doesn't want this message out. So we looked at the warning for idol believers last lesson. We also touched on the fact that God continually calls us. He calls the unbelievers. God the Holy Spirit, I told you, in common grace, is constantly putting the gospel and making it available and easy for them to hear and understand in front of them. And God continually chases the believer in after salvation, wanting to get you involved. It doesn't matter if you think you're weak or you can't be used. He can use you, and it's never too late to be used. So, let's get into it. Matthew 20, verse 8. Now when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers, pay them their wages, starting with the last group first. Big principle we're going to be touching on. Matthew 29, between today and next lesson. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. I told you that was a silver coin that represented a day's wager for a common labor, Matthew 20, 10. And so when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius, same silver coin. But notice what they thought, what they thought. They had already negotiated a deal early in the morning. If you've already negotiated something and you know it's coming your way, you don't have to think or you don't have to agonize, but when it comes your way, don't look elsewhere and say, well, I think I should have got more. You already knew what was coming. You negotiated that. Matthew 20, 11, when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, meaning they were disrespectful towards him. Matthew 20, 12, saying, these who were hired last worked only an hour, one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have been born, born the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. In other words, we've been out here seven, eight, nine or hours or whatever. These guys have been out here an hour, and look what you've given them. So they're complaining already. But in the morning, they negotiated when the landowner came to them. Matthew 20, 13, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, probably the one complaining the loudest, squeaky wheel gets the most attention. Friend, I'm doing you no wrong, he says. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? In other words, am I not giving you what we talked about? Why isn't this fair? This is the exact approach, believers. The exact approach we need to learn to use with religious people and unbelievers who challenge and attack the grace of God. We need to learn to put things back on people sometimes. When they grumble and complain and start attacking the Word of God or attacking what you believe, you need to remain calm. Calm and place their own words and questions back upon them as well as operate from a place of integrity and truth. Put some of the what they say and what they believe back upon them and do it with integrity and truth. You don't have to do it with anger. But put it back on him. So listen, friend, you believe this or you believe that and you're attacking me? Stop being intimidated by angry mobs and false narratives they throw in your face. That's all I'm telling you. Matthew 28. Now, so far, the slides are working. The owner of the vineyard, God, in the spiritual analogy, we know that. The owner of the vineyard, we're going to be looking at capitalism a little bit today. Free market is the natural analogy. So there's two analogies here. We always want to look at the spiritual first and highlight that, but there is a secondary to this. This falls under God's divine institutions. Institution what? Number one. God has four divine institutions. Institution number one always points to freedom of free will and freedom. God designed freedom for all of us. Remember, God has four divine institutions, divine establishments, whatever you choose to call them, Freedom being the first one, free will. Christian marriage is the second. Christian family, the third. And the fourth is nationalism. Freedom, Christian marriage, Christian family, nationalism. I've covered these before. When any one of the four begins to erode or fall under attack, problems begin to arise. And when left unchecked, it begins to crack the foundation of a client nation unto God, which I often call a Christian nation just my one of my terms when one of the four begin to crack or crumble or fall under attack one of God's four divine institutions problems begin to arise and when left unchecked in other words you don't get spiritually right adjusted to justice of God meaning that whole nation it begins to crack at the foundation that client nation unto God begins to have many problems please understand that so we are going to kind of look at the natural analogy today, and I'll blend in the spiritual as well, but the natural analogy is very important to understand because it focuses on 
one of God's four divine establishments that believe me today are being trampled. All four of them are being trampled on. God is free to bless us how he sees fit in the spiritual sense. And under his grace plan, no one can earn or deserve anything from their flesh. So the spiritual analogy is God is free to bless us how he sees fit under his grace plan. No one can earn or deserve anything from the flesh. So we can't really grumble about something God is giving us. We are all saved by grace and remain under grace afterward. Yet few believers embrace it and truly live in it or understand it. Please take note on that. Many do not understand, embrace grace, understand it, know how to live in it. And yet they will complain against God and they don't even understand the grace of God, giving them the air to breathe and the words to use to complain against God. Think about that. Just complaining against God in itself is God allowing you to complain against Him. There's grace in that. Many don't even recognize that, the grace of God. Unfortunately, many, and I'm talking about believers. Remember, this parable really highlights believers. And it highlights arrogant, self-righteous believers, legalistic believers, as well as other believers who are lazy and other believers who are not. Many only learn to apply it to themselves, grace others twisted into something that is a hybrid of God's grace meaning they have added some form of works or human standard to it that's what happens many people learn to believers learn to apply grace to self in other words they give themselves a wide berth of grace or they start to twist it which religious people do twist it into something that's a hybrid of God's grace it's not real meaning they've added some form of works to it or a human standard they've attached to grace really becomes cosmic grace it's not God's grace turn to Romans chapter 1 royal family Romans chapter 1 the legalistic believers were seen in Matthew 22 when he had agreed with the laborers that's a negotiation I explained to you the original context was he rolled up on them before he even had a chance to really talk to them they started negotiating to say we're gonna want this we're gonna want that and he said okay whatever jump on board all other believers allow God to dictate the conditions when you think about it. All the other believers in the, in the parable, whether they were lazy or not, allow God to dictate the conditions. Matthew 24 shows that. You go into the vineyard also, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. They trusted his character and integrity. That is actually a strong theme within pagan belief systems, what we're going to see here, which was a common name for people who practice rituals and religions outside of Christianity and Judaism, a term that surfaced around the third century. What I'm going to show you about the, the arrogance of negotiating and trying to fit God in a box, this is actually a strong theme within pagan belief systems, which was a common name, pagan systems or pagans, was a common name for people who practice rituals and religion outside of Christianity or Judaism, a term that surfaced right around the 3rd or 4th century, I think it came up and became popular. It is sad to have to compare pagan belief systems to legalistic believers. It's sad to have to compare pagan belief systems to legalistic believers, but there is some truth in the comparison that cannot be ignored, and that's the path we need to go down a little bit today. It's a negotiation with a God, small g, that you see pagan people do, pagan belief system. A negotiation with a small God, small g, or creating a deity that fits into your lifestyle. That's what it is. It is the Walmart of religion. What's the Walmart of religion? Find a God, small g, or belief system that makes you feel good. You can negotiate, fit it into what you believe for yourself. That's what I'm telling you legalistic believers do and arrogant believers do that negotiate and play games with God. What they're doing is very similar to many of the early pagan belief systems where they found gods they could fit into a box that they liked. The Walmart of gods. You go into Walmart, you can find almost anything that you like. You cannot do that with a definitive God. You cannot do that with truth because it's singular. Even Allah, I was thinking about this, for the Muslim community, Allah is at least stationary. At least stationary. Although many do not truly follow Islam the way it was originally designed, 
it is stationary. Actually, the best example is ISIS. I wrote about this in my book. That group was one of the purest forms of Islam because they followed the writings of the Hadith, the writings of Muhammad, the Hadith, and the Quran. You have to have both together to be a real Muslim. Actually, they were accurately handling the writings of Muhammad. ISIS accurately handling the writings of Muhammad, if you understand the Hadith and the Quran. So as much as I disagree and I'm appalled, I'm appalled by it, a group like ISIS follows their religious beliefs to the letter. You got to give them a thumbs up and their God is stationary, at least. He's not going to fit into a box. They have to fit into what he says. We know there is only one true God, amen? One true God, one true Savior of mankind, and that triune God can never be manipulated or altered or fit into a box of our preferences. You can't fit Jesus Christ into a box. You can't fit God the Father into a box, God the Holy Spirit into a box of your preference and try to make it work and be one of the gods of the Walmart system where you can just shop around and find what you want. Anything that suppresses, negotiates, or manipulates the truth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His mind, the Bible, is false. It is from the kingdom of darkness. Anything that manipulates, negotiates, or manipulates the mind of Jesus Christ, the Bible, it is false. It's from the kingdom of darkness. Negative volition, negative volition suppresses the truth and seeks to substitute, which leads to the rise of liberalism. Listen to me carefully. It's going to be an important message today. And then into heathenism, which all point to pagan belief systems. I'll show you where we're going today. Negative volition suppresses the truth. People that are negative, they want to fit God into a box. And I'm talking believers even, unfortunately. Obviously, this is for unbelievers as well. But negative volition suppresses the truth. It seeks to substitute truth, which leads to the rise of liberalism and then into heathenism eventually, which all point to pagan belief systems, if you understand them and where they sprung up from. Anything we make a God out of, small g, anything we make a God out of besides the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the true God of the universe is a form of pagan worship. Anything you make a God out of, small g, besides Jesus Christ and the God, the triune God we know in our Bible, the God of the universe, is a form of pagan worship. Don't be fooled. The God of self, I taught you many about this, many times about this, the God of self, the God of the environment, the God of wealth, the God of celebrity, list goes on and on. False gods like Buddha, Allah, hedonism, Taoism, New Age movement, Scientology, on and on, along with a list of other satanic lies. It all falls under really a pagan ritualistic type of worship that you can, if you understand your history back to the third and fourth century, you'll see where a lot of this stuff developed. And many times in the Old Testament, when we look at different forms of worshiping the systems of Baal, fall under paganism as well, pagan worship. It hasn't gone anywhere, folks. False gods and pagan worship have many, many faces and a long history. I cover them on this channel when it comes up. God the Holy Spirit leads me there. In fact, today we're heading in a direction to show you some interesting things that line up with today, the year of our Lord 2021. In fact, many modern substitutes may be socialism, communism, or some other system or form of philosophy or materialism, but it always follows the same pattern. What is the pattern? Man, flesh, man seeking to establish perfect environment by man's power. It is away from the mind of Jesus Christ. It is away from the truth. Anything removed from the truth, the truth being singular, Bible doctrine, anything removed from the truth will take you in a direction of this liberalism, pagan worship, heathenism, eventually. That's what I'm telling you today. So please take note on it. The same pattern, we see it all the time. Man seeking to establish perfect environment by man's power, putting their own beliefs and their own gods, small g, or gods, plural, into a box that they feel comfortable with, and then spend their time worshiping and devoting it to that. That's the fallen army of Satan. That's not the triune God that we worship in the Bible. We touched on Romans chapter 2 last lesson, and I reminded you it spun off from chapter 1. In other words, you've got to, if you really want to understand 
first couple chapters of Romans, what Paul was teaching, you want to read 1, 2, and 3 really back to back and understand them as very well connected. So we touched on Romans chapter 2 last lesson. I reminded you it spun off from chapter 1. So chapter 1 was a warning about unbelievers and the world in which they create their own gods, small g, and they worship and they have worship systems outside of the true God of our Bible. How they worship and their worship systems of false gods, really, this leads to disrespect toward God's divine establishments. They might not even say it that they disrespect God's four divine establishments, but if they're away from the truth of Bible doctrine, eventually they're going to step all over God's four divine establishments, which is what? Freedom, free will, Christian marriage. You know what Christian marriage is? It's only two genders, male and female. Christian family and nationalism. So this leads always, eventually, to disrespect God's divine establishments. Romans 1.18. Pick it up in verse 18. I got it on the board. Okay, the, the slides are working. Everything's working. <laughs> Romans 1.18. Thank you for the prayers. <laughs> for the wrath of God is revealed from what? Heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Obviously, when you're talking unrighteousness, you're talking about cosmic system unbelievers that system verse 19 because that which is known about God is evident within them unbelievers know about God don't let them fool you for God made it evident to them God made it evident to everybody God is everywhere he is in everything don't believe the lie everywhere everything reflects God everyone with a sixth grade IQ has a sense of the divine creator of God of some God with a 6th grade IQ, I would say probably a 4th grade IQ, more often than not, it is highly intelligent elite of society who misdirect people and cloud the issue of God in our Bible. Most likely, most of the time, it's not those with the low IQ. It's really the highly intelligent elite crowd who misdirect people and they cloud the issue of the God of the Bible that we know. That's the big issue right there. And everybody follows them because they are oh so wise. Romans 1.20. What does Paul say? Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power, his divine nature, everything God is. There is a list of everything God is. Have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, if we look around, so that they are without excuse. Without excuse. As I always tell people, sit at the beach on a clear night. If tonight is clear and you can get some decent weather, I know down in Florida you can. As always, tell people, I tell them all the time, you got a, you got a God issue, you have struggling trying to find God. I always tell people, sit on the beach on a clear night, watch the ocean roll in, look out in the night stars, the moon, and take everything in and try to tell me there is no God. No one created this. There is not an intelligent design here. Investigate the complexities of the human body. Do you know just the human eye itself, if you do a study just on the human eye itself, when you finally research it and how it functions, you will say it's a miracle. There is a God. Go to the zoo. I tell people that all the time. I love to go to the zoo. Go to the zoo. Look at the shapes. Look at the sizes. Look at the habits of animals and tell me there is no God. It is everywhere all around you, as Paul is making clear in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 21, for even though they knew God, and everybody does, once they certainly once they reach an age of accountability, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, their norms and standards, how they think and live, and their senses, senseless, excuse me, hearts were darkened. We know heart means the soul, where your thoughts, your norms and standards are, your personality really is at. They knew, yet they refused to magnify or respect God as the creator. Their own self-worth, their own vanity stood in the way, really is what it says. Doxadzo is that first word you're looking at there. Did not honor. Doxadzo speaks to glory and honor, showing proper respect for authority and giving high esteem. In other words, if you're in the military, is a great example, and you're a private, and you see somebody walking in that has two silver bars, or they have a full bird eagle on there, you know it's a colonel, the two bars are a captain, or a star, 
a general, you kind of snap too and show the right respect. That's what this speaks to, proper respect for authority and high esteem. Mayatato is the other one, is a form of pride. When it says became futile, Mayatato is a form of pride and vanity that blinds a person. Blind pride, blind vanity. It points to idolatry centered upon your self-worth. The little god of self is really what it points to. You know how people make little gods of themselves? They look at themselves and say, man, I'm attractive, I'm smart, I'm great. Look what I did, I did this, I did that. It's a form of pride and vanity, self-pride, making a little god of self. Romans 1.22, claiming to be wise, because they always do, they became fools. And sadly, many of these that we're talking about here in the unbelieving world, the cosmic system, do have high IQs and paper degrees in the cosmic system. They're considered geniuses. Yet I can take a spiritually mature person who has a sixth grade education and they appear like geniuses from the Word of God. It's all your perspective. Romans 1 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23 And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, the perfect God, for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, human, or of birds, four footed animals, crawling creatures, anything but the real God. That's what it says. I covered some of these principles over six months ago, I think almost a year ago. This is a legal exchange within two parties in Romans chapter 1 you're looking at. I covered it. It's a legal exchange when two parties are well aware of the deal and they're eager to make the deal. It's like you go to a car dealership, you find a great deal, you negotiate with the salesman, he knows he's got a great car. You know you get a great deal. You go back and forth in exchange. Nobody's being ripped off in that exchange. They both are aware. Exchange or pay one thing for another, and you do it and you understand it. Anyone over the age of accountability with a normal mental capacity knows there is a God. We understand that. It is never hidden from them or some strange new principle that they hear at 30 years old all of a sudden. There's a creator of the universe, there is a God. No, it doesn't work like that. It starts at a very young age. Pull aside a 12 or 13 year old person and say the word God and ask them what they think. God is common knowledge to all mankind. These are people who willfully ignore God because the love of self and the cosmic system override any common sense they have. They're so saturated with self and the wisdom in the cosmic system that they're willing to exchange what they know deep inside about God. Willing to exchange. They've already made the deal. That truth, the singular truth for a lie. And God, being the perfect gentleman, gives them what they yearn for. Romans 1.24. Paul goes on to say, Therefore, God gave them up. Perfect gentlemen. They yearn for it. They, they search for it. They bargain for it. Therefore, God gave them up to vile impurity in the lust of their hearts, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Romans 1.25, for they exchanged the truth, they willfully, there's that word again, I explained it one time about eight months ago, this is two adults making a deal, they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Big win for Satan, who is blessed forever, amen. What do you think Satan wants? Satan loves creature credit over creator credit. That's one of the that's one of his battle cries. Creature credit over creator credit. Because ultimately he wants to be the highest creature because he is so intelligent and powerful. This is the definition of willful ignorance. When you exchange something, like I told you, it's like two consenting adults understanding the deal that they're getting involved in and they exchange and they're both happy with the exchange. This is the definition of willful ignorance. When you know truth, or have a sense of truth, and yet you exchange it for a lie, willfully, and understand it. No excuse, as Paul said. This is what the weak parent does that has a child who is consistently in trouble. We all know parents, maybe some of us have been that parent, that has a child consistently in trouble, and yet we turn a blind eye, and when the police show up at the doorstep years later, we act surprised. But all the while, while they were rebelling and doing crazy stuff, and you're being called to school, and all problems were arising, you kept ignoring it, or really nurturing that craziness, and now the police are on your doorstep and you act surprised. 
You exchanged that truth a long time ago. You were a weak parent. It's what the lazy person does when the car makes a new nagging loud sound. You ever hear somebody that hears a nagging loud sound and they say, yeah, I'll fix it, and they turn the radio up. That's willful ignorance. You turn the radio up and that nagging loud sound in the car has been going on for six months. And now you broke down on the side of the road crying for help to others. That's willful ignorance. There are many examples of it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us plainly and clearly, many of you know this. Wisdom of King Solomon, he, God, has made everything appropriate in its time. He also set eternity in their hearts, meaning all the human race, without the possibility that mankind will find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. You're talking about a deep curiosity here. God has given every human soul a divine gap of space where they will eventually come to search for him and fill it. It is what often many of our pulpits talk about. It is the cross-shaped space in your soul that only Jesus Christ can fill. Yet, he has left plenty out that we will not have all the answers in this lifetime and will remain curious, keeping us curious about him. But there is a gap there in your soul structure. There is a place in every human soul that longs for God. Only God can fill it and is curious about God. He designed us in this fashion to help us, to guide us toward Him. He's given us everything we need. Even the unbelievers are continually bombarded by God the Holy Spirit in different environments and situations to try to get the gospel in front of them. And God is everywhere around us, all of us. And He's even set inside our hearts a deep curiosity and a space in there only He can fill keep us curious about him. Yet many fill that space with cosmic garbage, addictions, false gods, some of the things we're looking at today. Heathenism, liberalism, have a foundation established on false narratives and half-truths, and many people fill themselves with this heathenism and liberalism I'm going to cover today. So heathenism and liberalism have a foundation established on false narratives and half-truths. A half truth is that little leaven in the lump of dough. The rest of the lump of dough is good. You got a little piece in there. So what I'm telling you is liberalism and heathenism are filled with false narratives, out and out lies, and also half truths. It's designed to feed us counterfeits from what King Solomon taught in Ecclesiastes 3:11. It's Satan's system to try to fill that gap and that curiosity that we just saw in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 3:11 on the board. If your foundation is faulty and without truth, then no matter what the conclusion is, you will be, remain without truth. Because your foundation started with some form of lie. Your foundation is already eroded, it's already weak. If your foundation is faulty without truth, then no matter what the conclusion is, <clears throat> excuse me, it too will be without truth. The small piece of truth, and I'll give credit here, where credit's due. And I do, always do, because I try to be academically honest. The small piece of truth within basic liberalism is a desire, basic liberalism, underline that, is a desire to help others and have a charitable spirit. Now, most liberals talk about that, but they don't go in that direction. Most of that is a lot of fluff of nonsense, but it is there. So there's a small piece of truth in basic liberalism about helping others and having a charitable spirit. Beyond that, Beyond that little truth, it promotes agendas and attitudes that step on freedom and manipulate people into action, which is the wrong thing to do. That's why I tell people all the time that follow my ministry, don't hit people over the head with the Bible and say they have to believe or they're going to die, or point out every sin that they've done. That's not the right way. That's manipulative. Don't do that. But these liberalism I'm telling you about, they build false narratives on mankind being good enough and equality is coming just around the next corner. We're almost there. If only they can conform everyone to their ideologies. That's not freedom. When somebody's trying to conform you to something, even if they're trying to conform you to the truth and they're using deceptive language or deceptive manipulative programming, they're trying to control you. That's a lack of freedom. Big problem. That's stepping on God's first divine establishment. Many bad and evil leaders or ideologies start off under good pretenses. In other words, 
they show you something that appears to be good on the surface. Listen, I remind people all the time, do your history, study history, because we repeat ourselves, we're like sheep. Adolf Hitler was loved for a period of time very early on. We thought even here in America, he was gonna be a pretty good leader, a little charismatic, maybe a little too zealous, but he was gonna be okay. And there was some followers here in America that thought he was gonna be a good guy until the onion was peeled. Many bad and evil leaders or ideologies start off under good pretenses. It's a Trojan horse that fools the majority, really. Something that looks like a gift or a good thing on the surface, that's a Trojan horse. Many liberal ideas are flown under the banner of for the greater good of all. That's the banner usually. This is for the greater good of all. I know we're taking away your freedom or this is uncomfortable. You might not agree with this, but it's really going to be for the greater good of all. Be careful of that. Liberal ideas are flown under the banner of the greater good for all mankind, yet they never accept the truth of the Word of God. They never analyze, use, use a deep analysis of the original scriptures. A great example is written in Genesis chapter 11. You don't have to go there. I'll put it on the board in a moment. About the Tower of Babel. Many of you know this. On the surface, it seemed like a great idea. On the surface. It appeared to be all about unity and teamwork. Yet it was the exact opposite of what God had commanded. Because what did he command? Genesis 9, 1, prior to Genesis 11. Then God blessed Noah and his sons. The flood's all over with. They followed his commands and said to them, Be fruitful. No nonsense. This is what the next step is. You built the ark. You survived. Now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 9, 7, almost the exact same command again. God repeats something like that. You might want to pay attention. As for you, Noah, and your sons, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Para sutrats. That's the term in the Hebrew. Para sutrats was the Hebrew terms used. Be fruitful and multiply. Para sutrats. God just washed the earth clean, and this is a command. You might want to take them serious. Both terms whether you're looking at fruitful and multiply, how they're used in the Hebrew. Both terms speak to spreading out in a vast movement and occupying territory across the world. This is a vast movement. You can't dress it up any other way when you put those two words together. It means huge. It doesn't mean go to this little area. It means everywhere. Vast movement, occupy territory across the world. This was a call to begin repopulation after the flood that would be worldwide. It was designed by God and it was to be God dependent. This was a huge, vast undertaking that was designed by God, it's a command, and it was meant to be God dependent. In other words, depend on me, depend on my word, depend on who I am, and start spreading out all over the place. That's how I would put it in layman's term for the year of our Lord 2021. Yet a deeper study into this tower, Tower of Babel, and the forces really behind the construction would highlight a satanic agenda. I don't have time today, but it's interesting the characters behind it had a satanic agenda, yet on the surface it looked good. Within about three generations after the flood, what happened? Genesis 11.4. Three generations, probably. Genesis 11.4. And they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let's make a name Sham is the word, sham, for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. God's plan was for them to be scattered abroad. That's what he told them. And more or less, he basically told them, yeah, vast movement, big movement across the world. They wanted to build a monument to themselves. But the command was, when you think about it, they're saying, well, we shouldn't be scattered. God actually said, yeah, be scattered. But isn't that how man thinks just a few generations after what happened? I would warn people about 9-11. We've got a, a, a pretty much a, almost a whole generation gone since that time. Think about it. Not a whole generation. You understand what I'm saying? Enough time is going by that you have some little kids that were three and four years old that are adults now. Are they remembering? They wanted to build a monument to themselves. The Hebrew word sham is what you see here for the term to make a name for ourselves it is used in the sense of obtaining great honor great authority power and it was used when a king or royalty
took over an area and it marked that area with statues and symbols of power. So in other words, this was uh, an analogy or like a powerful king or an army came in an area and they started erecting statues and symbols of themselves and their kingdom everywhere and saying, this is ours, this is our building, we took it over, this is ours, this is what we're going to do, it's going to be all about us and our kingdom and our rituals. That's what this speaks of. This speaks of power and great authority rely upon self like a king or a royal army that took over an area and began to mark it with statues and symbols of their own power. No recognition of God. You see, liberalism exploits the ignorance of people by appealing to what? Basic lust patterns, emotional patterns, whether it's food, clothing, access to easy income, equality on every street corner, the list is pretty extensive. It's called socialism, folks. Once it's in full bloom, socialism destroys all basic institutions and human ingenuity and integrity. I'll say that one again. Liberals exploit the ignorance of people by appealing to lust patterns, emotions, whether you're talking about food or clothing or having access to easy income or this or that, equality around the next corner, we'll get it, social justice, pretty extensive list of the promises. It's called socialism, folks. Once it's in full bloom, that's what it's called. Socialism destroys all basic institutions and human ingenuity. People don't even want to create anything anymore or go forward. It takes the fight right out of people eventually. And also, it destroys integrity. The modern progressive liberal, because that's their new word in the last 75 years, progressive and progressivism, the modern progressive liberal satisfies their ego by trying to play God instead of respect God. Everyone is equal, they preach, and they do not live in that ideology themselves. They usually set themselves up fairly nicely in the upper echelon and power and wealth while they're preaching equality. It's the old saying that I laughed when I told somebody in my family that really loved old Bernie Sanders ideas over the last couple years. I said, yeah. This Bernie Sanders, who's a multimillionaire, owns about three houses. He got up to the top of the ladder. Now he's going to pull the ladder up on everybody else. Now he'll implement socialism. Pull the ladder up. Nobody else can climb up. So they usually have themselves set up pretty well. They push equality agendas, yet do not have the ability or character to make it happen. And all they do is implement regulations or rules that squash real freedom, and the majority will pay for it. And they begin to play little gods in their positions. That's what happens, folks, whether you choose to believe that or not. I know this is going to offend and step on some toes, and it might not even make it on some platforms. But, oh, well, I'm not here to tickle your fancy. I'm sorry. I'm here to tell you the truth. What eventually springs forth from this liberal ideology and agendas is heathenism. Living for self, just wild, passionate stuff, which is a form of pagan worship pagan worship systems if you study them because the cornerstone of truth folks is the mind of Jesus Christ it's Bible doctrine that's the foundation of everything and it does not agree with their agenda or ideals so therefore it needs to be removed or what's really happening is altered to fit the narrative to fit in a box that's what's really happening I heard something interesting the other day on one of my news platforms online I do not follow mainstream media they're some of the biggest liars and they are against the American people. But one of the platforms was interviewing the new forms of Christianity that really lean very far left, and they're considered new Christianity because God is, is, is evolving and His wor Word is evolving, so therefore we have to evolve to accept the changes with rainbow flags that people don't even understand what the rainbow means. If they studied their Bible, they would understand after the flood what it meant, not what people make it to do. Just so you know, there is a new agenda, a new wave of Christians in their 20s and 30s, and some in there even older than that, and younger than that, that are saying the Word of God is evolving, and God evolves, so we have to evolve with the Word, and we have to change this and alter that. Be very careful what's coming. Just so you know, the true Bible teachers are fading fast. This becomes the crowd that seeks a perfect world apart from the one true God and the Word of God. They do not have the capacity or the integrity to do this because now all the responsibility and divine standards or godly establishments have been damaged or removed or changed for their utopia, 
for them to create their utopia, they either have to damage the Word of God, change it, alter it, put it in a box, or get rid of it. Truth is singular. You see, heathenism, which is really just living for self and pleasure, rejects the truth and seeks a false god and a false truth to fit what they want. They love, they love a lot of truths. I have my truth, you have your truth, this can be true, that can be true. That's heathenism, folks. Heathenism and pagan worship are simply the terms used to describe those who live for self and Satan's cosmic system and place little gods, G, little gods like themselves and their desires over the one true God. That's what they do. Once a society decides to live without God, the real God, a moral and spiritual vacuum will surface eventually. Maybe it take 20 years. Those raised in that vacuum will seek to replace or fill the vacuum with religion, legalistic nonsense or religious movements, or other gods, small g. And this is how the gods of self, the gods of environment, the gods of sex, the gods of power, celebrity, drugs, the list goes on and on, begin to dominate a society. The vacuum is filled eventually when God is removed, the one true God is removed. I always think about it. When was the Bible? The Bible was the oldest book in the world. The first book in the American school system, the only book in the American school system, was the Bible. It was removed in the 1960s, voted out. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be a whole bunch of other books, but why did that need to be removed? You think about it. Satan's been busy for a long time. So has this progressive liberal agenda. Maybe one and the same. Jump back into Matthew chapter 20. We'll get ready to close. I got about... I think 15 minutes. Matthew chapter 20, as we're getting ready to close. Liberalism is designed to appeal to the intelligent, listen to me carefully, intelligent unbelievers and believers. It does appeal to many intelligent unbelievers and believers. Progressive liberalism embraces the culture, pop culture certainly, and most of the society uh, changes, and plays the ultimate chameleon. Liberalism likes to play the ultimate chameleon. You know what a chameleon is? It's a lizard that can change its colors for whatever environment it's in. It can please everybody. It claims to be able to solve all problems while loving and nurturing everyone. We're going to take care of everyone here. It's the greatest chameleon, liberalism, progressive liberalism. It's designed to appeal to the intellect of the cosmic system and those that fall for it, many believers as well. That is why so many Christians vote for far-left politicians and far-left agendas. You wonder why? And they're Christians. And they, you can't, because you can't trust most of the right either. We know politicians, most of them are crooked. But most of your conservative Christian ideas that are out there are getting squashed. And you wonder why Christians lean far left now. It has to do with Satan's agenda and this progressive liberalism. Many of you do not know your own Bible. Unfortunately, those that study on this channel do, but many believers do not know their own Bible, and they want to be part of this big happy family of Satan's cosmic system. That's what they want to be, part of the big happy family, building a tower of Babel one brick at a time in the year of our Lord 2021. It's been going on a long time, folks. It's easier to go along and get along than to stand in truth and make waves, I always say. Truth can be a hard pill to swallow, and it does not embrace the everybody gets a trophy agenda. Truth is a hard pill to swallow. It does not always embrace the everybody gets a trophy agenda we live in today, nor does it fit the immediate gratification of this emotional society that we live in. Therefore, it needs to be squashed, changed, or completely get rid of it. Back in Matthew chapter 20, as we get ready to close, look at some principles here. Matthew 20, 11. When they received it, the legalistic believers, they like to fit God in a box, they grumbled at the landowner, verse 12, saying, these who were hired last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, we don't like grace, who have borne the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. This is the same group that negotiated their contract, and now... They're unhappy and crying about equality. You notice sometimes when you give an arrogant person something, they're happy for a short period of time, then they want more. Then they want more. So they're never going to be happy. 
just so you know. It's called implacable. They're bitter and unhappy people. So the more you give, the more they're going to want. It's like feeding the bear at the campsite. You can guarantee he's coming back for more. Same group that negotiated their contract. Now they're unhappy. They're crying about equality. Remember, the landowner is God in a spiritual sense. But in the natural sense, it's the reputable, respected landowner, the trustworthy businessman. And here's what he states. Matthew 20, 13. But he answered and said to one of them, the loudest probably, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. Did you not agree? Aren't we following the agreement? Am I not giving you what you asked for? Think about it. Did you not agree with me for the Daenerys? You guys made the deal. He simply speaks the truth. But what happens when the truth is presented to arrogance? And even the legalistic believer arrogance. Matthew 20, 14. Take what is yours and go. Good statement. Stand, in your, stand strong in your truth, landowner, which God does. But I want to give to this last person the same as you. I just want to do it. Verse 15. Is it not lawful? Business owner, God, is it now lawful for me to do what I want with my own? What, what is my own? This fits into a year of our Lord 2021 pretty well. Or is your I envious, jealous, and petty because I am generous? What's your issue? Many Christians that struggle with jealousy, pettiness, arrogance, and legalism have a very liberal viewpoint, and oftentimes they buck against true grace and true freedom. They don't really like it too much, unless it works in their favor. Some people like grace and freedom as long as it works in their favor. Just like they, you have a lot of political class and celebrities and media outlets that like to use the Word of God when it seems to work in their favor. Most of them don't understand their scriptures. They don't even know they're using them the right way. But you'll find the arrogant, legalistic believers like grace and truth when it works in their favor, not against them. They rejected how God established divine standards and institutions, and they live within their emotions, plain and simple, living in their emotions. They're much more comfortable with cosmic viewpoint, which is really just heathenism and pagan worship at its core. They're much more comfortable with what? Cosmic viewpoint, which is really just this heathenism or pagan worship at its core, whether you choose to believe that or not. The laborers of the field who worked for the only one hour may well have worked hard. Maybe it was divine good, which counts more than human good, because human good is what? Wood, hay, and stubble at the beam of seat judgment. While the first group of legalistic laborers may well have been sloppy and inconsistent workers. We don't know. Look at the spiritual and the natural lesson in this. Think about it. Divine good counts. Human effort does not. Human good. Either way, the landowner can reward how he sees fit, so too can God do what he wants. He created you. If he wants to snap his fingers and pull the air out of your lungs right now, he can. And guess what? He's not wrong. It's his plan. It's his way. He created you. Until we get humble enough to start thinking like that, we're going to always have some pettiness, jealousy, and insecurity in us. Free market capitalism. Listen to me carefully. Free market capitalism actually fits the business model that God ordained for prosperity in a client nation. Free market capitalism fits the business model that God ordained for prosperity in a client nation, a Christian nation, as I say. God rewards hard work. God rewards hard work and those who respect personal responsibility. God promotes freedom and is not concerned with social justice gender nonsense, skin color, or educational backgrounds. He elevates those who do the right thing in the right way more often than not. And when he doesn't, he has a reason why, and we ought to look at the spiritual reasons why. But he elevates those who do the right thing in the right way. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do your work heartily, putting yourself into it as for the Lord and not for people. In other words, whatever you do, you're doing it for the Lord. That's your thought believer. Verse 24, knowing that it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward, the reward of the inheritance, no matter what it is, God will give it to you and it will be worth it. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Underline that, believers. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve, not your boss. Verse 25, for the one who does wrong 
who will receive the consequences of their wrong, which he has done, and that without partiality. Listen, if you're a believer and you failed, dust yourself off and name and cite the sin. Most times God will just walk right along with you and correct the sin, no big deal. But if you remain in some type of behavior, that consequence is going to come back and get you. I'm telling you right now. God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we reap. Sowing means habitually over and over again. I'm not talking about having one bad day or having one issue. Don't remind that. That's just the wind. I think i got a rainstorm coming up. Get ready to close. Romans 12.10. Be devoted, devoted to one another in brotherly love. Devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 11. Not lagging behind in diligence fervent in spirit serving the Lord that doesn't sound lazy to me buddy relax relax my dog we're getting ready to close Proverbs 14 23 in all labor there is profit labor there is profit but mere talk leads only to poverty these are great scriptures if you want to know if God wants you to have hard work and free market capitalism matters and the right thing done in the right way 2 Timothy 2 6 in all labor there is profit. There it is again, but mere talk leads only to poverty. For 2 Timothy 2.6, the hard-working farmer ought to be first to receive his share of the crops. That goes against the liberal narrative right there. Proverbs 10.4, poor is one who works with a lazy hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Those who stay busy, not the lazy. Notice in 2 Timothy 2.6, not the government, not the poor, the hard-working farmer receives first. Not the government, not the poor. Proverbs 12, 24. i got to get ready to close. we got a storm coming up and my dog's moving around. Proverbs 12, 24. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy hand will be put to forced labor. In other words, you'll be in a situation very uncomfortable if you have a lazy attitude. Proverbs 28, 19. One who works with his hands will have plenty of food, but one who empties his pursuits will have plenty of poverty. Follows, excuse me, empty pursuits will have plenty of poverty. I gotta get ready to close. I'd love to go on and on, but there's a storm brewing, the wind's going, my dog's nervous. But these are great scriptures for you to jot down and understand what I'm telling you. Second Thessalonians 3.10, Paul tells them, for even when we were with you, Paul says, we used to give you this order, a command. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not going to eat either. How's that sound? How's that fit the Christian narrative? Verse 11, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined, lazy life, doing no work at all, by acting like busybodies, getting involved in gossip and nonsense, instead of being hard at work. Verse 12, Now we command and exhort such person in the Lord Jesus Christ to work peacefully, eat their own bread. In other words, mind your own business and stay busy doing the things God has given you. The believer can never negotiate for crowns, blessings, and rewards. Can't put your flesh in it. Just as in the natural realm, mankind cannot step on the freedom and business of others and then think that God is going to bless them out. There's a proper protocol. There's a right thing done in the right way. Let me say this again as we close. The believer can never negotiate for crowns, blessings, and rewards. Just as in the natural realm, mankind cannot step on the freedom and business of others and think they will be blessed by God. There's a proper protocol and right thing done in the right way. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for the, this time we have to come and study your word. Bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.